Now that you've uh, seen some benchmark models that you can use for forecasting, we need to start thinking about um, how well these models forecast and evaluating their performance. The traditional way of doing this is to actually take your data and split it into a training set and a test set. Basically, we use the training set for estimation and we use the test set for evaluation. Now, you can imagine that I can have a highly complex model that fits some data series very, very well. So you can imagine, you know, we've got squiggles in our data and we have a high order polynomial that can fit that very well. But then when we extrapolate that forward, it might actually flop and not forecast very well. So this, this setting is exactly testing that. What we're interested in is the forecasting performance of the models, not the actual fit to the data. Um, yeah, overfitting a model to data is just as bad as failing to identify systematic pattern in the data. So we don't, we want to avoid uh, overfitting. Um, just to reiterate, the test data should not be used for any estimation. We assume that we have never seen this data. It's the future that we are trying to forecast and we cannot use. This is what will happen in real practice. In real practice, you don't know what tomorrow looks like. You're going to forecast when tomorrow comes, then you can evaluate how good your forecast was. So a little bit of notation. Um, forecast errors, and now we are talking about true forecast errors, are depicted by this. So ET plus H, our H step ahead forecast error, is given by the difference of what I observe at H steps at, t at time T plus H minus my forecast, my H step ahead forecast, and see that forecast is generated only using data up to capital T. Okay, so only using the, tra the, the training data. So unlike residuals, forecast errors um, are true forecasts. They involve multi-step ahead forecasts. So let's go back to that diagram and just clarify this a little bit. Clarify the difference between a fitted value and a forecast and a residual and a forecast error. So... In this setting, we're going to use our training data to estimate our model and to get our fitted values at each point, we only use information up to the previous point. So if I wanted to get the fitted value for um, time t, so y t hat, that one step ahead forecast in sample can only be generated using data up to time t minus one. So as we said before, because we're using the whole data or the whole training set in this case, these are not true forecasts, hence we refer to these as fitted values. With our forecasts and the use of the test data, these are actual true forecasts. We can use data up to time capital T to estimate the model, and then we forecast ahead. So re let's relate these fitted values and forecasts to residuals and forecast errors. So our residuals are in sample errors are given by this formula here. So ET is equal to YT minus YT hat conditional T minus one. So, um, and we get these in sample or over the training set. Our forecast errors are again given by the formula that we saw before. So ET plus H is equal to YT plus H minus our H step ahead forecast. Okay. So to reiterate, um, these are true forecast errors as the test data is never used for computing that forecast. Let's have a look at an example. So this is the uh, beer production data that you've seen in previous sections of the book. Uh, we're going to split our data as a training and test set um, at 2007 Q4. And here I've generated forecasts from these benchmark methods that you saw in previous sections. And I've plotted the forecast on top of the test set. And we've forecasted one to 10 steps ahead. So now we want some method to actually evaluate how good these forecasts are. Okay, there are various measures of forecast accuracy. So um, again, to remind you of the notation, these are forecast errors. We want to summarize these. Now we can take the average of those and 
as it's natural, some of these will be positive, some of these will be negative. Hence, these will, a lot of these will cancel out. Now, if we just take the mean, this shows you something about um, biasness of your forecast, which um, you shouldn't have biased forecasts. So we don't pay a lot of attention to bias. We pay more attention to actual accuracy. Now, to get the accuracy, what we do, um, you can take the absolute values of each of the forecast errors and then take the average of the absolute values. So you get the mean absolute error. You can square these and take the mean squared error. So you can square all the forecast errors and take the mean of those. Now, if you square each one of those, that takes the scale to the square. We want to take the square root of that to bring it back to the original scale. So if you think about um, your Y in dollars, your E will be in dollars, your E squared will be in dollars squared, taking the square root of that will bring you back to the original scale. So we usually look at the root mean squared error. Now, another interesting measure is uh, what we call the mean absolute percentage error. So basically you take the errors, you take the absolute values of those and you divide them by the actual observation and times them by hundred. So this now becomes a percentage term. So we call these mean absolute percentage errors. Now, the big advantage of this is that it takes away the scale of your, of your errors. Okay. So the first, three uh, measures here, mean absolute error and mean squared error and root mean squared error, actually scale dependent, which if you're trying to evaluate just one time series, that's fine. But if you're trying to evaluate over 10 or 20 time series, a model, how well it forecasts those, then um, that is problematic because you have different scales and the errors, how big your error will be using these errors, these error measures will be dictated by the scale. Now, MAP is a scale independent measure, and it's, hence it's, uh, it's actually um, the, probably the most widely used error measure. Um, it is the most widely used error measure because it is scale independent, but it, also, it is also very uh, easily interpretable, right? Um, if I'm forecasting, I don't know, uh, retail in a state, uh, and I make a 3% error and I'm forecasting retail in the whole of the country and I'm making a 2% error, I can compare those. I can understand what a 3% error means against a 2% error. But it does have its drawbacks. Now, its major drawback is that you divide through by the observation, the future observation. And if this observation is zero, this is undefined. If it is close to zero, it is actually uh, very problematic because it actually skews that error measure. So, uh, you know, if that observation is, 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 it needs to be, that observation needs to be away from zero, far away enough from zero not to skew the results. The other thing that is problematic with this is that it doesn't have a natural zero. It only makes sense for scales that have a natural zero. Um, one of the examples we think about here is temperature and think about uh, degrees Celsius and degrees Kelvin. Zero has no meaning here and it's different for these two scales. So a percentage there doesn't make much sense. Now to overcome these, um, these disadvantages and these problems, these drawbacks with the mean absolute percentage error, Rob and Ann Collar um, proposed uh, the following. So instead of dividing through by the observations themselves, divide through by something that uh, accounts for the scale of the data. And they propose to divide through by the in-sample one step ahead naive forecasts. So this is the difference of the observations in sample. You take the absolute value of those. And that gives you um, the in-sample mean absolute error of the naive forecast. So you take each error and you scale it by that. Now these both are in the scale, same scale and hence the scale gets canceled. Now, if you've got um, seasonal data, it makes sense to look at the seasonal naive rather than the, um, the naive that we looked at for non-seasonal data. Okay, so then we're gonna scale our data, our scale each of our forecast uh, error by the in-sample um, seasonal naive uh, mean absolute error. Then we're going to take these scaled errors and we're going to take, we can take the average of them. And this is called the mean absolute scaled error, MACE. We can also square those and look at the root or, and take the square root of them and look at the root mean squared scaled errors. Now, if you're squaring the numerator, you also want to square the denominator. So in this case, our QJ squares, excuse me, will look like this. 
And this is for seasonal data. If it's non-seasonal data, we just set M equal to one and we take the, the naive uh, in-sample forecast. Now, one of the disadvantages of MACE, and I guess one of the reasons that it is not as widely used as the MAP is that it's not as easily interpretable as the MAP. It's not a percentage. It is a forecast error relative to the in-sample naive uh, forecast, mean absolute error. So basically, a value greater than one, you, it means that you're doing worse than what the in-sample naive does. A value below, you're doing, uh, you're doing uh, better than the in-sample naive. Okay, let's go back to our application and have a look at these and uh, some um, measures. So again, this is our setup. So we've, um, this is how we split our data. We're gonna, uh, we're gonna um, look at the recent production of Australian production and we're gonna grab the beard set from there. We set our training set up to 2007. So at the end of that 2007, so 2007 quarter four. Uh, we're going to estimate the models using the training set. So we're going to have the mean forecast, main forecast, seasonal naive, and, and uh, random walk with drift. Um, and then we're going to generate forecasts for H equals 1 to 10 steps ahead. Now, the way we're going to get our summary error measures is to actually use the accuracy function. And we're going to use it in two different ways here. The first way we're going to pass in the Mabel object. So remember this BF fit contains the estimated models and just rearranging and selecting some of the error measures that I'm interested in. So um, in this table now we have down the rows the actual models and across the columns um, the actual error measures that we're interested in and it also tells us the type and the type it recognizes that um, these error measures are um, calculated over the training set. Okay, so as expected, when you look across these rows, the seasonal naive, so let me just remind you of the data, the seasonal naive, it's seasonal data will do better than the other methods. Okay, so the, the measures, uh, all measures are lowest for the seasonal naive, RMSC, mean absolute error, MAPE, MACE, and RMS. SE. Now, the other thing that I would like to highlight here is these ones. Remember, with MACE and RMSSC, we are scaling the forecast errors, in this case, our fitted values, because we're looking at the over the training set, by the in-sample naive. So we're scaling the in-sample naive forecast by the in-sample naive forecast, hence uh, they're equal to one. Now, the more useful way of using the accuracy measure is to actually look at forecast accuracy over the test set. In this case, we need to pass two things to the accuracy function. We need to pass the fable, which contains our forecast, but also the data set. And we need to pass the whole data set because MACE needs to, to calculate MACE, you need the in-sample data as well to calculate the scaling factor. Okay, so again, um, I'm selecting the measures that I'm interested in. There's a couple more here that we're not looking um, we're not focusing on. So down the rows, we have the methods. Across the columns, we have the error measures. And again, clearly, um, the seasonal naive does best out of sample as well, as expected with seasonal data. And that's in for point forecast evaluation. 